Hello everybody. It's uh, delightful to see everybody here in person. A uh, bit of a change from the last three or four years. The topic today is COVID 4.0. On January 30th, 2020, the four of us in this very room addressed the issue of the Wuhan virus. Have the lessons learned from SARS helped? Three annual sessions later, we might ask the same question. I recall that on that day, one of us, me, felt that we were better prepared because of SARS. Today, I would qualify that statement. Gerald Evans was avidly contemplating the nature and potential of this novel virus named SARS-CoV-2. Samantha was concerned about our health system capacity, while Kieran knew we were in jeopardy and was redeploying public health inspectors to regional long-term care homes. It was during our first session that someone was heard to mutter that the phenomenon's impact might last for a thousand days. Most people dismissed that prediction, but it proved prescient. Our world in data describes that since that day in 2020, the world has experienced 675 million cases of COVID and 6.87 million deaths, both under counts. Society in all of its expressions has been challenged has been damaged and has responded. As they have been over the course of history, traditional non-pharmaceutical interventions were employed to shut down most human interactions to reduce the spread of this novel virus. Incredible advances in cell biology, genomics, vaccine development, and other therapeutics allowed a progressive resumption of societal functioning as the population developed by vaccination, acquisition, or both a degree of immune capability by definition absent three years ago. COVID has retreated, but nevertheless continues as a sort of gothic background noise in the tapestry of human pathogens, killing and harming many. The pandemic magnified social and health disparities and inequities, amplified the design flaws of our systems of care, and left a legacy of backlogs, crowding, waiting, and inaccessibility. In many jurisdictions, delivery of care is as challenged now as, it, as at many points during the height of the pandemic. So for the fourth time, we turn to our Queen's Health Policy Council panel, all of whom have been occupied and preoccupied by the pandemic, to speak for a few minutes as we think humbly about what we got right and wrong as we moved through the fog of uncertainty imposed by SARS-CoV-2. What did I learn advising a university principal Thank you, Patrick, during a public health crisis. First, to work closely with public health, and we did. Thanks to Kieran and his successor, Piotr Glaza, we were helped immeasurably by then learners in that program, first Dr. Azim Kazmani, then Dr. Sam Bonimer. This partnership was not always available to peer institutions elsewhere. I learned to trust faculty, staff, and senior administrators who responded rapidly, repeatedly, and effectively as we pivoted in and out of lockdowns, maintaining teaching, research, and support programs throughout. I won't list names, they are so numerous, but I noticed Mark Green is here, who as provost, helped lead this challenge. I learned to make sure that you have a Dan Langham, Head of Risk and Safety Services. I learned to use existing but flexible structures, not new ones, as you switch from a decentralized to a command and control mode. We learned to communicate. Michael Fraser's team provided timely information transparently and sensibly to very anxious audiences. And we learned to use and trust science. When knowledge and good evidence evolve as fast as a viral foe, it is easy to distrust those whose job it is to pull together basic principles with only shreds of good evidence and to make decisions in the face of irreducible uncertainty. In this, we were blessed by a wealth of human talent across our institution, and in particular in health sciences and the health sector, such as Gerald. We learned to be prepared. We did find the pandemic influenza planning document, but it did not anticipate societal lockdown, virtual classes, and the need to maintain essential research operations. This will need revision for next time. Despite that, we very rapidly developed plans for responding, to all possible scenarios and had time to mock up and practice them before escalation led to lockdowns. 
The story of putting this institution to sleep and waking it up has yet to be written, but there was much learning which should inform the future. So I will now turn to our other panel members, to Gerald, to discuss what we didn't know, what we know, and what we wish we had known, to Sam, her role is to discuss collateral damage in a pandemic, the expected and unexpected, and to Kieran, who's moved on to much more heavenly roles in the province to extract from his COVID notebook policies and principles for next time. So over to you, Gerald. I feel like I'm back in the lecture hall, I just turned on my microphone. So we'll see if we can get some slides up. Um, wow. That's a really big version of my slide. For those of you who were at talk last year will remember actually that little graphic that's a little cartoon on the left, um, which I think really kind of summarizes a lot of what uh, happens in medicine in general, but was particularly amplified during the pandemic. When David sent me this sort of uh, title, I said, and I've got 10 minutes. So preparing a 10 minute talk like this actually takes you about five years. Whereas doing a one hour talk on a complex subject that you know a lot about actually only takes you like a day or so. Uh, but let's see if we can blast through these things. Sorry for the slides, but I'm a medical doctor and I basically teach people who are visual learners. I myself am a visual learner and that's in medicine. If I was a lawyer though, I would stand up at this podium and wax eloquently. So apologies for the slides. So David already mentioned a thing about fog. I actually took this quote from uh, David Wallace Wells, who's a, a, an editorial writer for New York Times, and talking about the fog of war phase of the pandemic, which is what we're emerging from now, and sort of commenting that we're still struggling to see clearly many of its major features, captive instead to narrative formulations we've imposed on even messer, messier realities, perhaps as a way of avoiding the harder questions that might arise. And this is why I think there's a lot of uh, pessimism of what we're going to do in the future, because Really, I would say my biggest challenge during the pandemic has been narratives. And um, I talked to media a lot and I did a lot of media interviews and journalists are taught in journalism school, stories captivate your reader, your audience. And I'm a guy who recites data and tables and figures and I don't have, I said, I could give you anecdotes, but then I'd be breaking patient confidentiality. So I don't do that. So it's really, really challenging. So. What do we know now about COVID-19? And I would say we probably knew sort of toward the early part of the pandemic. One is that mortality from COVID-19 is greater than seasonal flu, and particularly in the elderly. And I'm going to show you a couple of graphs in a sec. Um, and this, I think, is really important because there is a narrative out there that this is no worse than seasonal flu. Trust me, as an influenza researcher for most of my ID career, this is a lot worse than influenza. Uh, we knew that vaccination was going to help us. And in fact, early on, uh, once the vaccines were introduced in December of 2020, we actually saw that it reduced severe outcomes like death. And we knew that non-pharmaceutical interventions were initiated early in the pandemic would slow transmission. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we saw. But the challenge was is that those um, measures, which included things like lockdowns, and closing schools, masking, physical distancing, hand washing, also uh, actually sometimes engendered some of their own problems. So let's look quickly at the data. So for those of you, uh, red is the mortality rate of COVID from a number of different studies. Blue is uh, the sort of seasonal influenza death rates from the U.S., from 2016 to 2019. And along the X graph, X axis along here, that's age. So you can see here, even at an early age, there was a 1.8 times higher mortality rate uh, if you were 10 years old between seasonal flu and COVID. And as you got older, that just continued to rise. And by the time you're in your 70s and 80s, you're looking at a mortality or case fatality rate that's 14 to 15 times higher than seasonal flu. So this is not a disease that has the same mortality as seasonal flu. This is a very recent study came out of, uh, by my Swiss colleagues, and they actually wanted to look at what about mortality once you hit the hospital. So maybe all the mortality was before you got to the hospital. Once you got to the hospital, you were laughing, you were going to have the same mortality rate as influenza. No, not true based on their work. And what they saw was that in COVID-19 patients who were admitted, about 7% of them died compared to 4.4% of flu patients. And the only thing that's interesting is to see the impact over time that early on in the pandemic, in the first wave, they actually had a mortality rate of 12.8% in hospitalized people with COVID. So COVID and flu are not the same when it comes to case fatality rate. And that's why it deserves some attention. This is probably though the most important thing. And I must say this every time I talk to a reporter or anyone else, the brunt of this disease has occurred in our elder population. This is a disease that kills old people. 
Now, if you want to be an evolutionary biologist, you could engender all some interesting natural issues around that. Having said that, this is the group that's affected. And unfortunately, this is not a group where society spends a lot of time worrying too much. We are beginning to now, especially people like me who are boomers and we're now getting to be older people, but it wasn't the case. I'll show you some Ontario data. This is confirmed cases of COVID way back uh, starting in December 21 to January 22. So this is Omicron here at the beginning. This orange line is people over the age of 80. And you can see that throughout the Omicron era uh, that we've experienced through 2022, the number of cases is much higher in older people. And yet they're the more heavily vaccinated group. So again, the vaccines don't prevent infections as much as they prevent severe outcomes. But even then, if you look at hospitalization, again, this orange group are those over the age of 80, they substantially are higher than the rest of the general population when it comes to getting hospitalized with COVID. And then lastly, you can look at deaths from COVID. And uh, they changed the color of this line. I don't know why they did that. It should stay orange, but now it's purple for people over the age of 80. But you can see that they really took the brunt of things all during the Omicron era, and particularly during that first Omicron wave that occurred at the end of December 21 and into January 22. So this is a disease that has really impacted the elderly in our society. And I think it demands a rethink on what we think is valuable. If this was happening in children, you would have seen a very different kind of reaction by society, not by those of us who take care of people. So let's move quickly then into the effect of vaccines. So this is actually a modeling study that was done by an epidemiology colleague of mine in, in Britain. And what you can see here in gray lines are the um, number of excess mortality that was seen. So that's a real piece of data. And then there's a black line which models it to fit. What you see here above it in light green is deaths averted by vaccine indirectly and then deaths averted by vaccines directly in, in turquoise or blue, whatever your screen's showing. And you can see the impact that vaccination had on reducing deaths, either indirectly or directly uh, through that. It's a model, it's not, it, it, but it's based on some reasonable assumptions within that model. So what about vaccines? This is actually a paper that just got published at the end of last year, and it talks about something that's really important if you're a, a scientist, this absolute reduction versus relative reduction, in this case, vaccine effectiveness. And what you can see here overall is that if you look at relative uh, vaccine effectiveness, overall is about 66%, but absolute um, effectiveness was very high in people who got not only a primary series or two shots, but boosters afterwards, and much more so than people who got only two shots of the vaccine. So why I still tell people to get boosters. And that effect is much more profound up here in those age over 65. And by the way, you can see here, they did boosted primary. And then on this graph, they did primary boosted. So that's why it looks confusing. So you have to be careful when you read these axes. But vaccines are very effective. They reduce um, uh, the, uh, both the severe outcomes and for at least a short time after you've had it, they reduce actually the bit of infection, but that, that is short lived as it is typical of all coronaviruses. And then this is just another model looking at the incidence of COVID uh, per hundred thousand people, um, uh, here. And you can see here in this blue line, this is what would have happened without vaccination. Um, and again, during this Omicron sort of, um, um, era. Well, well, this is actually Delta here, and this is Omicron, and then the second no Omicron wave here. So th there was a decided impact of vaccination that was very, very beneficial, both in incidents, but mostly in severity and bad outcomes like death. So what didn't we know, and we maybe now subsequently learned, is that transmission um, of, of COVID, the, the virus that causes it SARS-CoV-2, is dominated by close proximity. If you're close by somebody, there's lots of opportunities. I'll show you why. But one of the interesting things is that these short-range aerosols uh, have an impact, which is beyond what we see with a lot of other respiratory viruses. Um, we also know, now know that only when you use non-pharmaceutical interventions consistently and correctly, and I'm talking now about masking and all those things, does it actually consistently reduce transmission. If you kind of use it haphazardly, you don't see much of an effect. And that was, came out uh, in a couple of things, a Cochrane review most recently on uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. And then we also didn't know at the time that the predicted viral evolution was a lot faster than we thought for SARS-CoV-2 because it was based on our knowledge of coronaviruses and how fast they mutate, comparing them to a virus like influenza, which mutates very quickly. And that variant emergence drove the different phases of the pandemic. So this is what we mean by close proximity transmission. When you're in close proximity to someone who has COVID and you're susceptible, there's a higher likelihood of inhaling these short-range aerosols 
Um, you can get long range aerosols, but that's pretty uncommon and it's sort of quite unique. There's heavy environmental contamination with virus laden particles in the environment and through direct or indirect contact with these virus contaminated objects and surfaces and hands and things, you can result in transmission. So the contribution of short range aerosols is something that we learn. Uh, this is actually, a, I think a slide I showed last year too. This is a big study that was published in BMJ showing that in fact, hand washing, mask wearing and physical distancing all have a impact on reducing uh, the risk of acquiring transmission. And that makes a lot of sense when you're looking at a virus that's facilitated by close proximity transmission. Surprisingly enough, actually, hand washing had a slightly, as almost, I'd just say it's about the same signal as mask wearing. Yet uh, there are a lot of people out on social media that tell you, oh, just forget about washing your hands, just wear an N95 mask and put on an air filtration device. Well, I got news for you, wash your hands. And I can show you lots of data that support that. Um, and then this was the real challenge, I think, that uh, public health recognized. And this is actually a really cool study that just got published, JAMA Network um, Open, at the end of last year, that they did a survey of Americans. Now, these are Americans. They're not Canadians. We're much nicer. We're more likely to follow direction. But the Americans, what they showed is that over 40% of participants reported either misrepresenting their status, like I'm vaccinated or not vaccinated, or they just didn't adhere to the recommendations to wear a mask and do things. Um, and then this is sort of the breakdown of, of the broke quarantine rules, avoided getting tested when they were told to, told someone they did not have to quarantine even though they were supposed to quarantine. So now one could easily say, if you know anything about politics in the States, that's probably the breakdown of conservatives versus liberals and stuff like that, or maybe in some cases, Trumpians versus non-Trumpians. But um, essentially we know that the public doesn't necessarily follow these rules, at least in some countries. So the variants have been a really interesting um, issue. So this is uh, um, something, I think I showed this last year. This is actually a study done by a colleague of mine in uh, Trevor Bedford's lab, uh, Kissler is one of his uh, uh, postdocs. And they looked at the mutation rate of the S1, the spike protein uh, in COVID um, and compared it to the frequency of mutations that occur in influenza hemagglutinin, which is what we usually watch. And we always said coronavirus is a modest mutation rate, nothing like influenza, it actually panned out to be four times higher. So that's why controlling the numbers of infections was important because everybody who's infected with, a vi with this virus is going to have hundreds of millions of viral uh, replication cycles. And every time that happens, there can be mistakes introduced into the RNA of the virus. And that is what creates the emer and causes the emergence of variants. And people think, you know, you learn in, in school, like, oh, well, you get this RNA polymerase and it takes a template and it makes an exact copy. It doesn't make an exact copy. Most of these polymerases are dirty enzymes. They don't do a perfect job. They make mistakes, kind of like humans. Maybe that brings us as humans making mistakes. This is a little thing on, I call this the variant epochs of COVID-19. So here's the sort of beginning of the pandemic. And you can see here, Alpha becomes dominant in early 21, Delta in sort of mid 21, then Omicron in early 2022. And this is the, what we saw was that um, infections actually were relatively low during those early periods before Omicron came along. And then Omicron just, you know, threw the book out. And that basically Omicron became so infectious because of its ability to replicate quickly and because it actually used a different system to infect cells, that it kind of canceled out the population-based immunity that we had. So we had lots of infections. Surprisingly, though, we didn't have as many hospital admissions as we did during the alpha phase. And this is mostly due to the fact that there were less people vaccinated in early 2021. We were rolling out vaccine at that time. And then you can see deaths were really out here and deaths have really kind of dropped off. Why? Mostly because of vaccination, hybrid immunity, and because yes, in essence, Omicron's a little less virulent. This is actually a cool paper. I just had to put, I was trying to look for the right talk to put this paper in. Um, this is actually, uh, it was a um, uh, discussion. It was on, it's on the NPR website uh, under their goats and soda editorial or opinion pieces. This actually shows each one of these dots is an example of a virus, a coronavirus in yellow is dog, in red is pig, and in blue are camels and MERS of incidences where they've now in retrospect been able to go back, find out that a human got infected with a virus from a different animal. So viral specificity for species is very much in flux when it comes to coronaviruses. So the idea that 
somehow this one-off thing was only going to happen that one time in China. It's probably happening all the time, but by sheer luck, some of that species specificity stays in place and you don't, even though you get a dog coronavirus causing an infection, you don't pass it on to another human. And again, if you're following the news, the H5N1 outbreak in Cambodia, it's been shown not to be human to human transmission. It was within a group of families who were all exposed to the same birds that had avian flu. But if you're a, a malignant troll out on Twitter, you could kind of create this as trading all the, all hell's breaking loose and, you know, head for the hills kind of idea. So what did I wish we had known? Everything I just mentioned. Because <laughs> if we had known that at the beginning, then uh, my, my good friends in public health, uh, like Piotr Glaza, who's here, and of course, Kieran now, who's the chief medical officer, and Stam, who's a public health expert, you guys would have been able to do everything perfectly right from the beginning, wouldn't have closed schools, even though in our pandemic influenza plans, school closing was important because influenza gets amplified by school age kids. So, you know, that's the challenge. So a quick, a few other slides here, just so I can get, like blow off my steam. So a pandemic that SARS-CoV-2 was volatile and unpredictable. Oh my God, I mean, a new virus we know nothing about would be volatile and unpredictable, how surprising. And again, governments and health, public health advisors were making emergency decisions based on very little data and information on an entirely new illness. And this is something I think the public has to appreciate. Decisions had to be made early in the pandemic before we'd actually developed the vaccines, which panned out to we do exactly what we wanted them to do, which was to cut down the severity of this new disease as quickly as possible. But that didn't happen until we were almost a year into the pandemic. And of course, now we've got antivirals that do the same thing. I always reminded of Mike Ryan's quote, for those of you, it got broadly spread, but he was doing an interview talking about, well, what should people do? You know, you're a World Health Organization emergency management guy. And he said, be careful of not doing things quickly. Speed trumps perfection. The greatest error is not to move and the greatest error is to be paralyzed by the fear of failure. Well, that was great to say at the beginning, but all of us now who are getting criticized about everything that we suggested and did, that's exactly what we're getting is like, oh, you guys failed. Look how badly you did things. And if only you hadn't worked so quickly. Yeah, and just waited for lots of people to die or something like that. So anyways, now I'm, you can tell I'm really getting heated up now. Um, I, I found this picture, I thought it was really cute. <laughs> it, it's just a, a, actually a pictorial, a, a painting that was done to somebody, but you can see the guy who's the nice trim house and here's the person who did junk all over their yards, snoring away, not bothering doing anything. And that really represents the polarization of what's happened with COVID. We have people now still, even though I've shown you some data that suggested it is a very different disease now than it was, who are still terrified of COVID. And, and maybe for right reasons, at least personal reasons, but they want to amplify that on everybody else. And then you've got the people who a year and a half ago said, COVID is over. Why are we doing anything? Let's just get back to being our normal selves. And those two polarizations have really created problems. And of course, it gets pulled into politics and everything, too. Um, I think my uh, uh, Dr. Buttermer and uh, Dr. Moore may be talking about the adverse effects of, of, uh, in, of non-pharmaceutical interventions because we now recognize what they were. There's been this vilification of public health and I can't imagine a worse part of the outcome is that we vilified public health. These guys work like crazy to protect the population and everybody looks at everything to do with health from a personal perspective. And that's where the challenge lies. We've also now realized the adverse effect of human behavior which has not been helped at all by social media, especially when somebody like Elon Musk takes over a platform. Uh, that's uh, the way you get mis and disinformation. And I'll remind everybody that this book by Stephen Taylor, who's a uh, psychologist out at UBC, is a really good book to read if you um, want to understand things about pandemics. So and this actually came out just at the beginning of the pandemic. He had written a, a scholarly dissertation for an academic journal, and he turned it into a book. But what he recognized then was that there, in a pandemic, you get uncertainty. And uncertainty is a trait uh, which is associated with excessive worries and anxiety-related psychopathology. And so you get over-responses and under-responses from varying individuals depending on their background. And I would just point out that people on both sides of the pandemic I'll still seem invested in prosecuting arguments about mismanagement. And I have, for the first time in my life, had to do some legal stuff with offering opinions. Most of the time we pan out to be fine, but it's always people trying to say that we didn't we know at this point that this was going to happen. It's like, no, we found that out about a year and a half later. So this is the public's conundrum. And uh, this is a little bit of the 
pretty much. Um, you think you know everything. Then you start to study something and then you think there's more to this than I thought. Maybe I'm never going to understand it. It's starting to make sense. And then trust me, it's complicated. And yes, folks, that's where we are now is it's complicated. This is my favorite one. I got this off Twitter. It's called Brandolini's Law. And it basically says that the amount of energy to sort of spew at something that's stupid uh, is very minimal, but the effort to try and refute it is hugely hard. In this case, the guy says the moon's made of cheese. This guy explains why it's not made of cheese, which takes a lot of effort. And the guy goes, yeah, no, I still think it's made out of cheese. So, you know, this is when the challenge during the pandemic. And then this one I've used a few times. My favorite is this fake New York Times hired like all of science overturned by a single tweet. Um, and then the one on the left was the really the big impact of misinformation that is, as it emerged really during 2022, which has been the bad year for all this. So that's where I'm going to stop and just leave you with a couple of thoughts um, from people who are way smarter than I am, but uh, sort of let these things get into place. And one of them is don't let your ideas now uh, become part of your identity. If you become ideologically bent, you're going to be in big trouble when it comes to looking at science. And then see things as they are, not as you wish they were. And recognize that every time you think of something, that's basically a hypothesis waiting to be tested. So I will stop at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. On to Samantha. Samantha is, you know, is an expert public health specialist, family physician, co-teacher of mine in various endeavors. <laughs> and... Uh, helped immeasurably during the uh, response to COVID in the institutional setting. Um, I asked Sam to address collateral damage of the pandemic, the expected and unexpected. Yeah. Oh, the clicker's there. All right, hi everyone. Thank you again for having me again. Uh, I apologize, I don't know if the slides converted very well off my Mac classic problem. Um, but that's okay. I mainly stick with pictures. So um, I put a picture here of an iceberg um, in that a lot of what we knew about societal ramifications with regards to pandemics uh, was on the top, but there was so much underneath that we really didn't have an idea about before the pandemic occurred. Um, there was a lot of study that came out of the last really massive pandemic uh, over a hundred years ago with influenza post-World War I, but we, we hadn't really seen a phenomenon like this in this era with um, media and interaction the way it has been um, in our society. And so uh, there, there were unexpected consequences of, um, of the pandemic that hopefully now we can learn from and prepare for in the future and, and leverage as we move forward and, and sort of rebuild some of our societal structures. So the first picture here I include is um, of an individual receiving care in an ICU. And this was one thing that we expected, right? When we had uh, COVID, we knew that people were gonna get admitted to hospital. We were gonna see surges in need for ICU care. And that was what a lot of the focus was in a lot of conversations. How can we maintain hospital capacity? How can we ensure that we are there for people when they need critical care? Um, some of the ramifications from that we sort of expected, right? That we were going to have to cancel procedures like surgeries or do other investigations later because we had to maintain enough capacity in those ICU beds. There's a lot of kind of tumble down ramifications of ensuring critical care capacity in your system, but we sort of predicted some of those things. Um, but we didn't really predict, uh, we didn't really predict all of it. Um, this is a big one. So, uh, about 10% of people in Ontario do not have a family doctor at this time. One of the biggest things that we saw during the pandemic is that people retired. Uh, the risk ratio, risk benefit ratio just wasn't there for people anymore. A lot of our, especially our older family physicians who were kind of getting close to retirement, but continuing because they couldn't find a replacement when they were presented with the risk that they were faced with seeing patients themselves, knowing that, you know, the risk, the personal risk they would take on, um, in terms of being exposed, it just, the math didn't make sense for people anymore. Um, and then you have younger, um, 
individuals who weren't close to retirement, who also chose to close their uh, office-based family practice and move into other roles in the health system. Canada is a little unique in that people who train as family physicians with the College of Family Physicians of Canada work in a lot of different environments. Um, our family doctors work as hospitalists, admitting patients to the hospital. We have family doctors working in Emerge. And in a lot of places in this province, those uh, the surge capacity needed to be maintained so people would shift into those roles um, and shift away from their office-based family practice. Um, about uh, 3% of uh, Ontario family doctors stopped practicing in a six-month period in 2020, which is about double what we normally see. So usually we see about one and a half percent, um, which, you know, we can have replacement, right? New family doctors graduate, replace the old ones um, who are, have retired or moved into other positions. But we just outpaced that. Um, and it, it ends up reducing sustainability in a dramatic way. So by reducing the number of family doctors, we have the strain on primary care increases, which makes people want to leave even more. And we saw this across not just family physicians, we've seen this among other professionals. This is something we're seeing in the media now, nurses choosing to leave hospital-based practice, and it's because they're given too much work. So for an example of this, we have the ICU, we're talking about maintaining capacity in ICU. Um, there have been, you know, in the past, pre-pandemic, sometimes there'd be some staffing issues. Usually you want to keep a mainly one-to-one -one ratio between nurses and, doc, uh, and patients in a place like the ICU. Um, but uh, pre-pandemic, you know, there might have been some staffing issues. Maybe sometimes you might be a little lower than that ratio. We started to see later in the pandemic, this is like 2022, right? Like once people are starting to get really tired and have put in a lot of extra hours and they're getting burnt out, that we're seeing, you know, ICUs staffed with half the nurses that they need to function. And so people are doing one to two patients. That's a lot busier for you, which means it's even more stressful to go to work, which means maybe you don't want to go to work so much. And anyone who's in my health policy class or in my health system class know that I talk about this, that some of the relational aspects of work matter in terms of retention. So if I'm a physician um, or a nurse working in the hospital, my colleagues help give me that energy that I enjoy from my job. The moments where you're sitting in the break room together, having a coffee and talking about your day, make people like their work and want to come back. And COVID got rid of a lot of that, right? We weren't eating meals together anymore. We weren't stopping for a coffee. We were trying to move people uh, you know, away from people as much as possible to keep physical distance. We were told explicitly not to hang out outside of the hospital because you didn't wanna see an outbreak among an entire department and have that entire department fell in terms of inability to go to work, right? You know, if all the ID docs gathered for dinner and COVID was there, and then, uh, you know, they all had COVID, none of them would be able to go to work. The hospital can't function without that service. And so um, we did a lot in terms of these um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, we did a lot of them in healthcare settings, and that really has dramatically impacted our workforce. I think this is one of the biggest ramifications in terms of health system functioning, and it's going to be remarkably difficult to recover from because of that snowball effect. When the workplace gets to be unpleasant, it's harder to get more people to come back, but you need even more than you did before in order to make it a better place to be so that more people wanna come back. Um, and, and the people who've left, it's gonna be really hard to convince them to come back. And then there's some governmental choices such as Bill 124 that are, is limiting increases in pay that also um, will dramatically impact our ability to, to have workforce retention. So this is what scares me because this is not a 2023 problem. This is a 2020s problem, right? This is not something that's going to get turned around in, in 24 hours or in, uh, in a year even. You know, this is going to take a decade to recover from. We've talked about this as well, how COVID um, truly uh, exacerbated the inequities in our society. Um, and I talked about this a lot last year, and that this remains true. Um, structural inequalities in our society have been um, dramatically worsened through the pandemic. And this is somewhat predictable, unfortunately. Um, the people who you know, had to work at essential service jobs, but mainly lower income um, 
jobs, working poor, getting exposed to COVID, bringing it to their intergenerational households. We know that there was an increased burden of COVID, both in terms of acquisition of illness and death and hospitalization for individuals um, uh, who are from racialized groups in Toronto, for instance, right? We, we know these things happen and they were unfortunately remarkably um, predictable. If you're ordering your online shopping and Mississauga has a big warehouse, the people who had to go work at that warehouse were putting themselves at risk for you to get your online shopping, right? We know that children, particularly vulnerable children or families with children also face substantial ramifications, particularly with regards to um, childcare. And, and that has a gender lens to it. We know that women uh, face a disproportionate impact of that. I have stories of friends whose uh, workplaces, they were working from home and they would actually get um, criticized by their employer for engaging in childcare during the workday. But what are they supposed to do? There was no childcare because there was no school. Uh, and and um, it was disproportionately a burden of women uh, in that regard. Um, we know that this is intersectional. I could talk about, I could do an hour long talk on this. I could talk for hours and hours on this. It's hugely problematic. But one positive I would say is that we're talking about it. I think one thing that I've noticed in the past few years that is different from the years previous is that there seems to be a lot of social discourse with regards to structural marginalization in our society. And one of the first ways that we can tackle some of these problems is through talking about it and through developing public will to, to target these issues. So we can build on this momentum. This is a photo of uh, uh, an individual who was the first person to be vaccinated against COVID in, in a, um, this was a German town. Um, but vaccination actually highlights some of those structural inequities that we saw that we need to discuss. So um, this here is a photo um, with regards to vaccination and this is a, an indigenous boy. Um, and part of the reason I chose this photo is that um, there's substantial distrust, understandably, among different groups in Canada with regards to the health system. Um, we know that uh, many instances of the health system um, enacting violence on populations. We can talk about tuberculosis and in Inuit populations in the North. Um, we can talk about bringing uh, vaccine preventable diseases to North America. We can talk about a lot of the harms of colonization. I think um, one thing that is harmful and, and continues to be um, challenging is that um, people therefore who already face structural inequities from society are more prone to therefore um, maybe have mistrust for the health information that is coming because of the experiences that they've previously held. And so what we started to see, um, is, I'll take Toronto for an example again, there were some, um, again, racialized minority groups that were harder to vaccinate. And it was because um, of the lack of trust in the system. And that trust is something that we had not built previously. Um, and so uh, we saw differential impacts. If, if People, we know from Gerald's talk, vaccination is what's saving people in terms of hospitalization and death. And it is, um, it continues to be an issue with regards to um, oppression. Um, misinformation in general uh, can undermine the support that we have for public policies and, and trust and expert advice. And um, the visible impact is, you know, not getting that COVID vaccine, but there's a lot more insidious impacts in terms of that erosion of trust. If people don't trust vaccines, and then they maybe don't trust the doctor who told them to get the vaccine. And then maybe the next time that their chest hurts a little bit, they're less likely to present to the emergency room because they don't believe that they're going to receive care that is aligned with their beliefs. And so um, that erosion in trust in the system and lack of accessing care can cause huge ramifications in terms of people's health outcomes. Um, we know that trust is fragile or eroded in some groups, um, particularly groups that are experiencing colonialism, um, systemic racism, and other forms of exclusion. And we need to be considerate of the fact that uh, the pandemic has exacerbated that. So with regards to a lack of trust, this is a huge problem too. Um, and I will try to keep it brief, but I only have three slides left. Um, so trust in media and, and government is fundamental in terms of having a functional society. And, and we know through research since the start of the pandemic that this trust has fallen in Canada and globally. Um, and the thought is that misinformation around interventions such as vaccination or, uh, uh, or non-pharmaceutical interventions um, has been contributory to that. So all of this fake news has actually contributed into the erosion 
of trust into officials, the public health officials, governments. Um, there, uh, and uh, this is predictable though. We knew this going into the pandemic that these sorts of things happen. Um, and, and so the, the problem is, is that it has maybe some more impacts than we would have expected than just people not trusting their government. Um, the misinformation environment actually can discourage research, which is really unfortunately interesting, um, and, and have personal impacts on scientists. So a survey of 300 scientists that engaged with the media on COVID, at least 15% of them reported receiving death threats for their work, right? Over 20% of that group reported that the experience is influencing their willingness to engage with the media in the future. This is silencing people. And this is not silencing people in a general way. Again, this is differential. Um, some respondents chose to even exclude themselves from commenting on relatively uncontroversial topics because of the stress that they experienced in this. So a personal anecdote, I made my Twitter private for about a year and a half. Uh, be, and this was actually after receiving some strange messages from people, weird retweets that were sort of um, very uh, critical. Um, and uh, I also did this on recommendation from the CPSO. Uh, they actually said, you need to, you know, not let people comment on your posts right now. Uh, and I was doing some work with them around COVID misinformation, um, but that was not even public work. Uh, so it, it was actually very uncomfortable for me personally, and I did very little public, public work on this. I was working with Queens, but that was it. I can imagine that someone else in a more public sphere might have been even more uncomfortable with the thought of being a spokesperson. Um, and, and this un increasing and uneven level of risk particularly affects women and BIPOC scholars. So a study done here in Canada showed 14 female scholars that it, uh, looked at 14 female scholars who experienced online harassment um, and uh, the responses were self-protected. So generally included self-censorship. Um, and so we're silencing um, the groups that we need to be amplifying and, and there's being silenced because of the threats that they're receiving. Um, an analysis of Twitter responses to tweets from Dr. Theresa Tan, the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada, found harassing vitriol that questioned her credibility, sought to silence her, and included racist and sexist messages. This was rampant. And this has an effect on people. Um, so uh, this is something that we need to be cognizant of. And I, I'm, I'm truthfully honest that I don't really know exactly what we need to do about it. But um, it is a problem. And it's something that I can't say I necessarily expected going into the pandemic. I had media training as a resident uh, in public health. I always enjoyed doing media interviews, but I have to say that COVID put a chill on me too. It's uncomfortable. So this last picture though, is maybe a little bit more hopeful. Um, one thing that we did see coming out of COVID that I think is positive is that uh, at least in some jurisdictions, trust in local government and feelings of local unity were higher post pandemic, well, post the start of the pandemic and continue to be steadier. We saw that streets with more independent businesses and connections to local community fared well during the pandemic, as opposed to um, regions that didn't have that. And so we, we know that people in our society want to be living in communities, and this is an opportunity to harness that interest. People are, are, are looking for connection, and this is our chance to, to make that change on a, on a city scale um, and regenerate our community spaces and our neighborhoods. Um, we can strengthen our local environments to mitigate cr chronic disease and climate change by creating active communities, walkable communities with active uh, transportation. And we know that urban sprawl continues to be unsustainable uh, for the health of our individuals, physically, mentally, and for the health of our lands that we're on, and that we need to move to more connected spaces. And this presents a political opportunity, a bit of a window to push for more of that. Um, so uh, we, we have hopefully an opportunity here to revamp our society in a positive way and um, to encourage uh, connectedness and support. Um, and, uh, and, and that gives me hope. So I'll end it there. Thank you. So we now turn to Dr. Kieran Moore, uh, Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health. Kieran and I, Kieran and I started uh, together 20 years ago on the expert panel on SARS, where we learned some lessons. And uh, he has now ascended to the dizzy heights of Chief Medical Officer of Health and will tell us what he thinks about the past, the present, and the future. Thank you for joining us, Kieran. 
Thank, thank you so much, David. I, I hope you can hear me okay. Oh, the thumbs up from Gerald. Uh, honored to be back on the panel, David, uh, Gerald and uh, Sam. Uh, and uh, great to hear all of your voices. And uh, I'll build on the optimism that uh, Sam uh, ended with, although recognizing that um, structural marginalization, uh, building ongoing social collateral, social cohesion and connectedness is absolutely a lesson learned from the pandemic. Uh, just with the brief uh, few minutes left, because I'd still love to have some questions, uh, uh, any of the policy students, please read David Naylor's, <laughs> David Naylor's report, David Walker's report from 2003, 2004. <laughs> it resonates today as it did yesterday. My concern is, is that, you know, the thousand days that we've gone through this plus um, and the expertise that we built uh, through individuals like Gerald, um, there's a cycle of preparedness uh, and the cycle goes down. The investment in preparedness and response decreases uh, and we're left vulnerable as a society, as a medical community, um, uh, to be able to respond to these threats. These threats aren't going away. Uh, they're only increasing in frequency uh, globally. Um, you just have to be watching H5N1 circulate, uh, luckily only in birds uh, now, uh, but the ongoing risk of uh, other emerging infections, uh, Mpox, uh, polio, measles, um, that we've uh, previously, well, polio and measles previously had good control of, uh, they remain a risk uh, at our societies for outbreaks uh, and we must always maintain that state of preparedness. So um, I am releasing the CMOH report to the legislature um, uh, in the coming weeks about maintaining the gains that we've uh, uh, achieved in Ontario. Uh, and they include the, the gains in surveillance, to be able to provide real-time data to decision makers, but also to the public, being very transparent and accountable of how we're trying to use data and science to inform our, our decision-making uh, on public health measures, but also uh, on therapeutics, uh, vaccines, et cetera. Um, so uh, surveillance, um, uh, we have to maintain all of that capacity that we've built. We've built great testing capacity to be able to respond to any pathogen, I believe, going forward, great networks across our hospitals, uh, community labs, as well as pub Public Health Ontario. We've also built good clinical expertise to be able to respond uh, to these threats and clinical assessment centers. And that, that knowledge and capacity, uh, we have to be able to call on it any given time. Uh, thanks to our basic scientists, we have therapeutics that we're able to offer. Uh, and as Gerald and Sam uh, pointed out, uh, very effective, safe uh, vaccines that have really got us to the point that we are today. Uh, and now we're, we have to look at ongoing protection uh, of uh, uh, Ontarians, Canadians, uh, through an effective vaccination strategy. So we, we're looking at what the frequency going forward of vaccination protection, maintenance of immunity should be in, in Ontario. Absolutely, as Samuel said, Sam said, we have to be working uh, with our highest risk communities to protect them, whether they're in long-term care facilities, retirement homes, or uh, in certain communities across Ontario and continue to work with our First Nations Inuit Metis. We have to maintain the, uh, the, the hospital capacity and absolutely acknowledge the HHR issues uh, that are confronting the world. Uh, uh, this is not a unique uh, experience of Ontario to be dealing with significant HHR issues in, in, for health resources as well. Maintaining our capacity to communicate uh, transparently, accountably uh, to the public uh, as well is exceptionally important. Maintaining the science committees that we've struck through Public Health Ontario um, on infection prevention control, communicable disease, uh, immunization, uh, these will continue. Uh, and uh, our infection prevention control uh, uh, has improved dramatically across Ontario and our capacity to protect Ontarians with made in Ontario products. If you remember, we were finding masks uh, globally that uh, Ontarian healthcare workers uh, could use at the beginning of this, but we now have a very uh, dependable domestic supply. And now you're seeing from a bio uh, manufacturing capacity, um, the federal provincial governments are, are, are building capacity for vaccines to be created uh, uh, and uh, produced in Ontario and in, in Canada. So um, we, we've made remarkable strides. We just have to uh, maintain this capacity because the frequency of pandemics, I believe, given global travel, the zoonotic risks, the interaction between humans and animals, and the rapidity of, by which they can spread um, will only be increasing going forward. Uh, uh, and hence, you have uh, my commitment uh, in this office commitment to learn from the thousand days and the experts in the room uh, in which you're in uh, and ensure that we uh, uh, hold, 
hold uh, accountable uh, our governments to continue the investment in, in the, these efforts. And I will be uh, hopefully reporting back to the leg legislature on a regular basis on the state of preparedness for, for pandemic threats. So I'll stop there. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to speak once again uh, to uh, this uh, audience. Thank you very much, Kieran. It's lovely to see you. And uh, maybe uh, these, or I guess with me, Matt, do this for five minutes. Uh, I think it's miraculous. Um, uh, so we have time for some. I'll let you know. All right, you're a student. Go ahead, Hal. Thanks very much, Mark. Okay, thank you. Is that on? That is on, I can tell. Uh, uh, just a really quick question, and that is institutionalization of the elderly. Uh, do we have statistics on the incidence and death rates of people living in long-term care facilities versus people who were not in the same age cohorts? Yes, And That's a simple answer. What yeah, do they just, say? Say that the likelihood of you dying if you were in a long-term congregate setting was much higher than if you were not yeah. in that session, independent of age. So yeah, um, yeah that, we know that that happened. And in fact, dreadfully to say so is that Canada in particular did very badly compared to many other countries. Yeah, so if we wanna talk about prevention in future, if we do care whether older people die or not, and I'm a baby boomer who really cares, uh, uh, should we not be advocating very strongly to cease institutionalization? There, there's so many reasons for that. <laughs> I think the, the Aging Well report for any students who haven't do dove into this topic covers it nicely. Um, there's many harms associated with institutionalization. Just in terms of pandemic planning alone, the isolation that people experienced was um, so re remarkably harmful. Um, in terms of direct and indirect effects, mental health and wellness. Um, and then uh, the, the risk of infection was so much higher. Um, people tend not to generally want to uh, move to these environments uh, many times, and, but there's no real good alternatives in terms of home care provision. Um, it's a huge, uh, huge problem that needs to be tackled um, beyond the risk of infection. Yeah, the only thing I can tell you that came out of this, try, I'm, trying, I'm gonna try and be Sam because she was just Gerald, um, is that we developed a, a system uh, for people like myself who work in infection prevention control at the hospital level to supply the resources necessary to long-term care. Because one of the things that we discovered early on and why we were so badly affected is that long-term infection prevention control measures in long-term congregate settings is very, was very poor, very, very poor. And so we developed a hub and spoke system here in the province of Ontario, where, for instance, here in the southeast, uh, KHSC, where I work with my director of IPAC, we are the, we're sort of the hub and we have spokes that go out and we can respond quickly and urgently to IPAC issues when outbreaks occur in long term care that didn't exist before it now exists now, I think we still have to maintain that structure but that's about all that we can do, at least when it comes to this infection issue. But Sam's point is well taken as anybody would be. My mother-in-law, who I dearly love, who unfortunately has her son-in-law, I'm the only one she seems to recognize anymore, which drives her daughters and son crazy. <laughs> Why does she know the son-in-law? Um, she was in long-term care during this whole thing. And she's very fortunate. She lived, she's in a long-term care uh, in Quebec, which is extremely good. Um, and they put measures in place. But that loneliness effect and trying to do Zoom calls as a, as a substitute just doesn't cut it. Karen, you said, uh, as uh, your uh, associate deputy minister role, you said a table is that just past the, uh, the dilemma of investing in long term care. And we've heard our figure uh, the increase in long term care capacity versus society's investing in home community care. There's another jurisdiction countries like Denmark. Right? An increase in long term care capacity since 1989, and they've chosen to invest in people at home or on the equipment. Uh, any, any thoughts from your Johnson position on the 
Uh, well, I couldn't hear you all, David. I think your, your microphone's moving around, but I completely agree with the emphasis should be at uh, uh, healthy aging at home and supports at home and improvement in home care. Uh, that absolutely is a direction, uh, uh, I believe, of government to improve the home care services to enable individuals to stay in their home as long as possible. I, there is a role for a long-term care, especially for the complex uh, uh, individ individuals with complex medical needs that have uh, obvious troubles mobilizing and couldn't live independently or at their uh, at their home, even with home care resources. So uh, there is a role, but uh, I think this government will be investing further in home care resources. Fair. Yes, uh, one question at the back, then we'll come, I don't know how much time people have, but. Uh, thank you, that was a very interesting talk. My question is regarding the, um, burnt um, out doctors and physicians and nurses. Um, I know that the medical schools and the nursing schools have very rigorous requirements, but I know there are many who surpass them. Um, so I wanna know what your opinion is on expanding the resources yeah. to increase the workforce right. so that we can deal with not only um, the things that come from the pandemic, but we have an expanding population in Canada with newcomers, immigrants, and an aging population too. Yeah, so health workforce is a really interesting problem. And David, I'm sure, has some background on this as well. But fundamentally, um, most of our uh, healthcare training is an ap apprenticeship model, uh, which means that you need to have people train the people to train, right? And we're already, in terms of, say, nursing capacity, it's actually difficult to ramp up our teaching um, because we have to find preceptors who can take on students. And when they're overwhelmed with their work, they don't want to say yes to those kind of jobs, right? So um, there has been movement in this. We have a lot of jurisdictions in this country that don't currently train learners as much as others, right? If you go to a place like KHSC, Gerald always has residents and med students on his team. Um, but there are other, you know, parts of uh, the province that don't have that. And so there is work moving kind of to change some of these geographical location uh, limitations, like starting the Lake Ridge training site for um, medical students, that sort of thing. But there is potential and work is being done in it, but it's actually logistically more challenging than it seems on the surface because of the workforce that it takes to train people. And we're already facing workforce training struggles. <laughs> It, you know, that uh, dilemma, for sure. Um, I spent 30 years in the emergency department, as did my friend Murray over there. The idea that next week we would have 25 extra medical students or learners, you know, when we don't have enough of ourselves to look after patients is a challenge. On the other hand, as you say quite correctly, uh, the number of medical school and nursing school positions is limited by government funding in Canada. Uh, so many highly qualified students go elsewhere to train. And at the moment, there are, I believe, 3,700 Canadians studying medicine abroad uh, in Melbourne and in Dublin and in all over the place. For them coming back to Canada to enter further training is highly problematic. There's one workforce there right away that we could access. These are not people who failed to get into professional schools because they didn't know enough, just because the, the numbers were limited. Uh, there are a variety of ways to do that. I think Sam spoke eloquently about making the work environment as beneficial as possible, even though there's a challenge so that it is the place you want to go to work in ICU or wherever it is. So yes, it's, but it is a challenge that is not fixed easily to make uh, a doctor like Sam takes as a slow learner. So yeah. It took a long time. Uh, or it takes a, a decade or so to get there. So if we want to make more ICU nurses, that's going to take some years. So it's a big challenge, I agree. I like but, it. uh, it's not a one-year issue, it's a 10-year issue. I, I think you'll hear investments from government at, at, uh, on multiple fronts on the HHR uh, I, coming up very soon. I do think Queen's is a, a leader. The Q-Arms program, competency by design program, a potentially shortened residency program, shorten the entry into medical school. Uh, there is a goal to decrease the total number of years in, in, in the medical school and nursing school, compress it to three years if possible or shorter, um, following competency uh, based uh, design and working throughout the summer. So th th there'll be investment and in innovation and in education to shorten the time frame to get these health professionals out. Uh, and the announcements should be very soon. Thank you for that question. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, 
Yes, please do. Then we'll go to you, Pat. Thank you. Um, this is a little difficult with for me, so just bear with me. Um, in May of 2021, my brother-in-law died from a from a, a vaccine injury, um, and that was uh, verified by the chief coroner of Eastern Ontario, Dr. Paul Dungy. And in his report, Dr. Dungy said that he could not rule out a genetic component to the death. Uh, my husband was mandated to take two vaccinations in order to, to keep his job of 20 years at Queen's University uh, without recourse to any conversation with anyone uh, regarding any concerns around that. Um, and this created an immense psychological and emotional trauma for him that continues to this day. Two of our children in their late 20s decided not to be vaccinated, not because they were so-called anti-vaxxers, but because they were afraid and they had personal reasons not to be vaccinated. And yet they were, their lives were made a living hell. They were ostracized, they were vilified, they were called misogynistic, racist, uh, selfish, and they were none of those things. They were, they were simply you know, concerned and made a different decision for themselves. So I guess my question would be, uh, what can we do in the future from a public health perspective and a policy perspective to make sure that there is room in the conversation for everyone's lived experience, including my own families, which is different than most people? Thanks. Well, thank you very much. That's a very, very important question. And uh, I'm sorry for what happened in your family. Maybe I will give a second or two to think of themselves yeah. for Sam and Karen, but where the rights and interests of the individual run headlong into the rights and responsibilities of maneuvers that uh, support society as a whole, because there's a nexus point there that is, as you point out, very problematic. So Sam, yeah. you want to go first? Yeah. That? It's point. So in 2021 in particular, I spent a lot of time providing, um, I guess, medical care for individuals who uh, were hesitant with vaccination. And I think one thing that came out of that for me and, and my training kind of led into this as well, is that generally speaking, the vast majority of people who are hesitant with regarding of vaccines um, are not hesitant because they hate society or because they don't believe in science. Um, often it is similar uh, anxiety uh, driven behavior um, that, uh, that leads to uh, concerns. So I think societally we failed um, in terms of our discussion around vaccine hesitancy. We, I, I could have told you this before the vaccines came out, the, the vast majority of people who would be hesitant would be hesitant for uh, fair reasons um, and that uh, building trust was way more useful than maligning individuals. But unfortunately, um, much of the public discourse around this was not necessarily driven by individuals who understand vaccine hesitancy, right? It was a lot on social media. It was a lot of people talking to their friends and like you said, ostracizing um, which is really unfortunate because truly, from my perspective, if I want to encourage people to be vaccinated when, you know, if I believe that that's the right thing, you know, from a medical perspective, and I want to encourage that, um, building trust and building relationships is the way to do that. And ostracization does what Gerald mentioned. It, it makes people dig in their heels around their opinions and beliefs. Um, and un unfortunately, there were a lot of people who dug in their heels on both sides. So my learning point from this uh, is that you know, generally speaking, open discourse is so important. And to consider that most people make decisions based on their own personal information. Um, and that, you know, sometimes someone might make a decision that you personally disagree with, but that doesn't make them a bad person, even if you don't think it's a good decision. And um, we give people the, you know, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt when we make decisions uh, that maybe are not socially popular, but we don't extend that grace to others. And I think extending grace to others is fundamentally important. That's what I spoke about this first time that we did this back in 2020, um, that truly we need to make sure that we continue to see ourselves as a group working together. Um, and I, I think that fell apart. And I'm so sorry for what happened to your family. And, and, um, and truly, I, I, I hope that 
your family has had opportunities to meet with individuals who are more compassionate. Karen, do you have any words on this? Well, I, I, I'd add my condolences uh, on the death uh, of your family member. Uh, and uh, ho hopefully you've had also discussions with the Vaccine Injury Support Program. That is a federally um, mandated program that is, its purpose was to be transparent and accountable yet that yes, there are negative untoward uh, effects of, of vaccine and individuals who come forward to get vaccinated to protect themselves and their family and their community should be compensated. So I, I hope that that process uh, is um, uh, available to you. Uh, as well, uh, from the government's vantage point, uh, when we asked, we asked for a, a vaccine policy. That policy if uh, should have been to the point that if you don't get vaccinated, um, they offer, the, whatever the policy was, they offered an alternate uh, to the individual. So if you couldn't, if the school didn't want you to come to the classroom at a university or college, then you would uh, be allowed virtual. Um, so, so in our vantage point, we, we wanted it to, uh, to, to, to be a policy framework rather than a mandate. And we did not have a mandate uh, in Ontario um, from, from this government's vantage point. Uh, but clearly, uh, uh, organizations were able to adopt or modify that policy to their, to, uh, I would assume, to their belief system or, or need at that time. Um, and I'm very sorry for the untoward negative uh, uh, feedback that your families received regarding their immune status. Thank you, Karen. Should we do more? one more? Pat, you've been very patient. No, no. I, I was just thinking one thing about the incident with the homeless. Homeless. Last question. On homeless uh, yeah. I, I, so in terms of uh, COVID among the homeless, so if we consider people who are underhoused and who lack housing, um, I had data on this from last year. I think it was a four times greater um, incidence. I'd have to pull up the numbers to be certain. Um, it was dramatically higher. And it's, it's not surprising um, given the lack of supports. This is yet another group that faces structural marginalization by society. Um, and uh, uh, we did not protect them to the same extent that we protected others. So um, the, I'm happy to speak more with you around the unfortunate direct inequities we saw within populations around COVID uh, acquisition and mortality. Um, and uh, it, it was unfortunately dramatic. I, I will say that many, many health units, uh, KFLA included, um, worked at the consumption treatment site integrated care hub to provide vaccination at all hours. Uh, they also went to the tent, uh, tented individuals off Montreal Street to try to provide vaccine and continue to do that on a regular basis, as well as screen for other infectious diseases uh, uh, prevalent in our community uh, and try to make accessible, available care. Um, uh, and this is something we hadn't traditionally done in the past, and I certainly hope we continue to do going forward. Work much more closely with the vulnerable populations. Yeah, I, I, I just like to add two things. So I was on the Ontario COVID-19 science, uh, COVID science advisory table. And, and one of the major concerns that we had at the science table was actually all of this problem with um, uh, groups who were disadvantaged um, in the healthcare system in general and the homeless in particular. And we had very great um, uh, input from innovators in the management healthcare of people in those various groups, including the homeless. And we did everything we could to you know, rectify what was a really challenging situation. And on a personal front, I can tell you that our hub and spoke group of IPAC at KHSC uh, was very much involved with public health in organizing infection prevention control when there were outbreaks amongst the population of homeless individuals uh, with public health uh, offering opportunities for them to be in a place, safe place to be able to be provided care. And we helped with setting up infection prevention control practices there, but it's really challenging. This is a very challenging population to be able to bring into things the things that are very structural, like IPAC um, or those other things. But certainly there was an enormous amount of attention paid. And even with that, and pointed out, you know, there were higher rates of, uh, of adverse outcomes in those groups. For sure. I mean, it's worth keeping in mind that many individuals in those groups have experienced trauma at the hands of the health system. And so again, there, that trust in choosing to be vaccinated, that trust in accessing the health system when they experience ramification, um, that was often not where you'd want it to be. Um, and it's because of experiencing, um, having negative experiences and encounters with the health system. 
Great. So I believe we have a couple of students to thank our panel. Could we have a question? Um, on behalf of the School of Policy Studies, we just would like to thank our esteemed panel of experts, um, Dr. Walker, Dr. Evans, Dr. Bidamir, and Dr. Moore for joining us again for the fourth year talking about lessons learned during COVID-19 and what we do going forward. So Dr. Evans, thank you for really shedding light on the challenges government and health pro professionals face around the narratives that individuals can create when they look at health um, with a personal lens and how that can really impact um, uh, public health implementation. And then thank you, Dr. Budimir, for really shedding light on the expected, um, but at the same time, unexpected consequences that we face in regard to the healthcare um, workplace, um, the health inequities and erosion of trust, but also how there's definitely a window for opportunity to build from uh, local communities. And last but not least, thank you, Dr. Moore, for emphasizing the need to build social cohesion and social capital and how we must continue to remain prepared for future pandemics um, and the importance of continuing surveillance and data collection for public health um, and in the process really remaining accountable to um, the public so we can strengthen public trust in government and its institutions. So thank you. And I'll, uh, I'll add my thanks to the panel, but also to all of you for attending. Uh, it's great to see everybody in person.